all times, tracks, trail and highways served humanity as keys to evolution. Empires and civilizations disappeared, centuries-old dust swept capitals and cities. We go on the Treasures of the Nation expedition to reveal facts about life at the crossroads of antiquity. In this issue, where did the Kipchaks of King David disappear? Are Georgian Princess Tamara and Prince Bagration the Kipchaks' descendants? What came to the boundless great steppe from the Caucasian mountains and what went to the deep gorges of Georgia from the steppes? Modern international airports are the same caravanserais of the past, the crossroads of distant worlds, the binding threads of the civilization, the kaleidoscopic mirror reflecting the broiling and multifaceted life. Who are all these people? Where are they going? Why are they traveling? Our intention is to pose the same questions, although in relation to antiquity, to historians. Off we go to Georgia, back to the past, and into the wonderland of unresolved mysteries. The traces of the multiple centuries' presence of the Asian nomads in the Caucasus become evident at once. It was not by accident that the ancient quarters of the city of Tbilisi remind of a Central Asian town dazzling with familiar names. Mirza Mualim, we... Mirza Mualim. we came to the square called Maidan. The Kazakh language has the word Maidan. What does this suggest? In addition to being called Maidan, this place is also called Shaitan Bazaar. It is purely Turkish, because the local population is mainly Turkic. The Maidan place consists of many streets that in the past were actually the Bazaar or Market Rose. It was a huge market here in the olden days. Chashi Bazaar was Turkish. In Istanbul, they also have the Chashi Bazaar. We have it here as well. And this is all due to the fact that the Turks had lived here for a long time. Are there any Turkic toponyms in Georgia and in Tbilisi? Here on this street, for example, there lived Boyakchi or Boyak, which means painters or dyers. Its residents were mainly Turkic. Boyau, yes, we have such a word. Looking up, you will see the Gala. It is called Nari Gala. It's a fortress. We also have the Karavasla. They came from Turkey and Iran and were like merchants or profiteers. So the word Karavasla is similar to our caravanserai. It's actually the same. Karavasla is what Georgians call it. But the original name, in fact, is caravanserai. I'm now on the embankment of the Kura River. Behind my back you can see Karavasla or the Tbilisian Caravanserai. The building dates back to the 19th century, but it has kept its ancient title. Previously the river came right to the place where I am now. This is where they unloaded boats with goods coming from all over the world they would carry the loads through those arches below. Let's have a look inside. Karavasla is a special, sunny and gorgeous building. Once upon a time, merchants lived here. Goods were stored, brisk trade was taking place, 
which as you can see has not stopped to this day. Today you can shop for Georgian national souvenirs here and it's rather popular among tourists. The traditions of Caravanserai live on. Thanks to the special geographical location in the most ancient times, the nomads of the Great Steppe had used Georgia as a convenient route to southern countries. The contacts between nomads and settled residents were taking place all the time. They were more than regular. They traded among themselves. To this day there is the so-called Daryal Pass, the major pass through which the steppe people maintained their communications with their southern neighbors. On occasion, the nomads used the Daryal Pass to wage a campaign to the south, the fact that is regularly reported in ancient chronicles. They obviously negotiated with local authorities that allowed the nomadic army to go through the Daryal. The nomadic troops would winter in Georgia, in its eastern part where there are steppes and good winter pastures. The roads across Georgia and specifically around Tbilisi were built even earlier by the Scythians. It was from here that they struck the crushing blow on the ancient state of Urartu. Here in the territory of present-day Azerbaijan and Georgia, the Scythians established their own state. One of our archaeologists, Rustam Abramishvili, who made excavations in Tbilisi and its vicinity, found a rich burial and the settlement of the 7th century BC. He believes one of the centers of the state was located exactly there. Professor Gagoshvili is convinced that the ancestors of Georgians constantly communicated with the Scythians and that it was mutually advantageous. Thanks to the most ancient developed metallurgy, the Scythians received weapons in commercial quantities from Georgia. They had found many more Rakinogs here than in Scythia. In fact, yes. At one of the excavation sites close to an imperial residence, at the gate of the residence we found a settlement where apparently the security guards used to live. So the weapons that we discovered there were Sarmatian. Can you imagine? Sarmatian. Modern Tbilisi is a bright and attractive tourist place. And not only thanks to the tremendous beauty and traditional hospitality of the Georgians, but also due to the fact that the city is among the top 10 most affordable cities in the world. In addition, it is a huge transport center as well as the place where various types of arts actively develop. Not to mention that it is the twin city of Astana. The word Tbilisi translates as a warm spring. The city was founded on a source of warm mineral water very good for human health and is now well known for its ancient thermal baths. Due to its advantageous strategic location, Tbilisi used to be the object of fierce wars since time immemorial. In 1089, the throne of Georgia was occupied by the 16-year-old David IV. At that time, the country was devastated by the Turkic Seljuk aggressors. 
He decided to expel the Turks Seljuks from Georgia and to finish the national amalgamation of the country. Prior to King David IV, for 400 years, Georgia was under the rule of the Persians, Arabs, Byzantines and at last the Seljuks. At the end of the 11th century, the military and political situation in the region turned out rather good for Georgians. King David began building a new army, reconquering one fortress after another and actually stopped paying tribute to the Seljuks. In 1118, David, together with Georgi Chkonditeli, went to the northern Caucasus and annexed the Ossetians. After that, King David started his negotiations with the Kipchaks. Since the 9th century, the Kipchaks were a formidable military and political force. They created a mighty state on the territory of modern Kazakhstan. King David entered into negotiations with the then Khanate governor Atrak. The military alliance was additionally fixed with a marriage. David took Atrak's daughter, Goran Dukt, as his second wife. Does it mean that since that time the Kipchak elite became a part of Georgian aristocracy and could influence the historical events in Georgia? Stay tuned! Together with a Kipchak princess, about 40,000 Kipchak horsemen moved to Georgia, but the total number of nomads that settled in the southern part of the country was close to 200,000. By this, King David created a barrier of Kipchak nomads against the Seljuk nomads to get ready for the decisive battle in the Didgori Gorge. How did the Didgori battle unfold? According to Latin and Armenian sources, there were about 500,000 Seljuks and 50,000 Georgians. That is, there were 10 times more Seljuks. The two armies met in the narrow gorge. From the Georgian side, a small group of warriors with a white flag went forward, and the Seljuks allowed them to pass into the center of their battle formation. When the main troops started their approach to engage, the given up Georgian group suddenly began a diversion attack in the midst of the Seljuk's troops that led to disorder. At that same time, the main Georgian forces struck the Seljuks, and the opponent was put to flight. Unfortunately, nobody could tell us about how the Kipchaks fought in the Didgori battle, nobody in Georgia can at present, but we know it ourselves. The Tbilisi masters at arms, though, can show us the Georgian combat arts. The Georgian martial or combat arts are divided into four types, including the mandatory wrestling that every soldier had to be skillful at. There are about 20 different types of wrestling in Georgia. Two of them are the most important. One of them is called Kadiorda or wrestling standing upright. There are many limitations, for example, fighting only with your legs. Its purpose is to teach a warrior, holding a weapon in his hands, to withstand the enemy's attack with legs. And then the actual combat with weapons, with a shield and sword, or such sticks and shields, like these ones here. In the course of the fight, the warrior makes very small and light blows and strikes, basically preparing for the final lethal strike. The lethal strike is done using the shoulder, whereas only the wrist is used for the preparatory strikes. It should be said that this story about the false capitulation of the Georgians in their battle with the Seljuks is a mere assumption, out of many that the scientists simply kept to for a long time.
примерно за месяц до непосредственно Approximately a month prior to the Didgori battle, David has attacked the Seljuk's allies along the border of Georgia and successfully defeated them. King David used deceptive tactics. For example, he would establish a false camp in the depth of a gorge to mislead the opponent. The enemy's vanguard forces would slowly approach the camp thinking that the opponent was still very far. Meanwhile, King David would make an ambush, cut off the advance guard from the main troops and destroy them completely. The main troops would continue their march towards the potential battle place, not suspecting that the advance guard was already destroyed. So they didn't expect the sudden attack, and that was the tactics that King David used, suddenly striking the Seljuks on the move. The same happened in the Didgori battle. Due to the panic, the Georgians destroyed the enemy, and the Seljuks were destroyed and the survivors fled. Just like that, Didi Gamajuaba. The Didgori battle meant a lot for Georgians. As our ancestors managed to destroy the soldier coalition army and expelled the Seljuks from the Caucasus completely. In 1122, King David took Tbilisi, freed the city, and since that time it has been the capital of Georgia. At that time, our country was quite large. It was considered the golden age of Georgia. Georgie, could you tell us about the weapons that the Georgians used in the Didgori battle? Of course, let me show you. Small shields like these ones. This large ring here is also unique. They would put it on their thumbs like that. I'm already scared. How would they strike then? The strike targeted the head. They would hit the head and start twisting it. Very painful. Severe pain from it. The victim was in shock condition. <laughs> We call this one Satevari. Another common name for it is Kanjali from Turkish. Yes, we call it Kanja. It's the same. Satevari is its Georgian name, and its shape precisely repeats the shape of the Bronze Age Satevari. What about shooting? I see a bow here. It differs from other bows by its size. It's huge. Akanji Lambert, a missionary of the 17th century that had lived in western Georgia for 18 years, said that Georgian bows were the same as Turkish ones, but much larger as to their overall dimensions. In Georgia, very few artifacts of the Kipchak era survived to our days. We learned that near Tbilisi, in the area called Dmanisi, they had found several Kipchak tombstones. This is exactly where we are going to see them with our own eyes, show them to you and honor the memory of steppe soldiers that protected Georgia with their lives. We are now in the neighborhood of Dmanisi. 
There is a gorgeous fortress, an Orthodox church, and what is the most interesting for us, the tombstones known as Koitas in Kazakhstan. We are accompanied by a distinguished local historian, Elshad Bey. Tell us, please, what century do these stones here date back to? These are the gravestones covering the graves of the Kipchaks, the ancestors of yours and mine. How many of them are here total? About 50 or 60, I think. Unfortunately, nobody protects them. Have a look here. Some of the tombstones are broken. They break them and even steal them sometimes. So apparently the Kipchaks had left a worthy mark in the history of Georgia and even facilitated the golden age in the country's development. However, soon from the same step from where once the Georgians had received help came a sudden and devastating storm. In the 20s of the 13th century, Georgia was attacked by the Mongols. One of the versions of the chronicles of the Mongolian invasion into Georgia says that when the two armies engaged in battle, the Mongols didn't endure it and ran. Although in the course of their retreat, they managed to kill many Georgian warriors and wound the Georgian prince Georgi Lasha. Some of the chroniclers allege that the Georgians even won the battle. The second version of the chronicles is more detailed. After the battle began, the Mongols imitated their panic flight, and the Georgians began to follow them. That's when the ambush group made its strike. Subide struck from the other side. The Georgians were devastated and ran from the battlefield in panic. Prince Georgi Lasha was lethally wounded and hardly escaped death. The great victory, Alda Yalalt. However, the Mongols didn't go deep into Georgia's territory. It was just a reconnaissance mission. After several years, that is in 1236, the Mongols appeared once again in southern and eastern Georgia and sequentially seized the fortresses of Shamkor, Lori, Ani and Kas. Georgia surrendered. Could you tell us how the Georgian lived under the Mongolian rule in general? During the time of the Horde, there were 14 different types of tribute that they had to pay for the roads that they had built and used, for cattle, for agricultural activities. The tributes were imposed on whole industries and trades, 14 of them, can you imagine? In addition to these requisitions, the Georgians living along roads had to feed the passing by Mongols, and that impoverished many families. What were the overall consequences of the Horde period for Georgia and for the Georgians? Starting the 20s of the 13th century, the Georgian culture had thrived, and then it all started to decline. Culture science, crafts and urban life in general. The people suffered a lot, as it became really hard to live and survive. They lost their land. Many families were forced to abandon their homes and find shelter in the mountains. Based on the statements of the Academy Fellow Metro Valley, the overall consequences of the Mongolian rule for Georgia were mainly negative. Yet Professor Riulon Gagoshidze is not so inclined to dramatize the Hood era. The Mongols did conquer Georgia, and the Georgia surrendered to them, but the Georgian statehood survived. It was still an independent country that paid tribute to the Mongols and was engaged in warfare. Iulon Batono counts the nomadic waves that reached his land in the olden days. The Turkic Seljuks, the Khazars, the Huns, the Bun Turks, the Kipchaks, the Osmans or the Ottomans and others. The relations with all these nomads developed based on approximately the same model. 
Of course, they plundered the country, and the Georgians could not withstand it and pay tribute. Yet the state remained independent. The nomads didn't need this land, they only wanted the tribute income. What is your take on the mutual relations between Georgia and the Great Steppe, the nomads and the Georgians? Since the most ancient time, we had very good relations with the Transcaucasian nomads. Our kings and princes used their assistance. They always employed nomadic horse riders. Georgie, did the Mongols, the Kipchaks or the nomads in general exert any influence on the Georgian martial arts? Before the arrival of the Mongols, Georgian swords were straight and two-edged. After their contact, Georgian swords became curved as the nomads' sabers. In addition to the bladed weapons, the Georgians adopted the stirrups from the Kipchaks. Do you mean to say that before the Kipchaks, the Georgians never used stirrups in their horseback riding? The horse mounting technique without stirrups is still used in Georgia. They appeared in Georgia thanks to the Kipchaks. What about the fate of the Kipchak prince's Grand Duke that we mentioned in the very beginning? The one that became the second wife of David the Builder. Some claim that exactly this line of imperial dynasty gave birth to the legendary Georgian Princess Tamara and the hero of the Borodino battle, Prince Bagrationi. If this is true, it means that the most significant persons in Georgian history had Kipchak blood running through their veins. Perhaps this is the most exciting mystery of Georgia, agitating the consciousness of nomadic descendants. Let's turn to professional historians to finalize the matter. David the Builder had two wives. One of them, whose name is not known, was of Armenian descent. His second wife was a Kipchak and was referred to as Grandukt in Georgian sources. Grandukt and King David had one son, Vakhtan, and apparently at least two girls. From his first wife, David had one son, Dimitri, who occupied the throne after David's death. Then the throne was taken over by his son Georgie and then by his daughter Tamara. So Queen Tamara is King David's descendant from his first wife. At that time, Vaktang was 12 years old. No doubt he could not be the leader of the nation, but one part of Georgian feudal lords, perhaps with the help of the Kipchaks, because Vaktang's mother was a Kipchak, wanted to enthrone this second prince's son and use him as a proxy. Yes, exactly. It often happened then, but they failed. Dimitri kept the throne and probably after the coup was over executed all of them as he did with his brother, but we don't know exactly. We have no references to Vakhtang in known sources after that event. Can we say that after the event, that is the unsuccessful coup attempt, the traces of the Kipchaks disappeared? Did they leave the country altogether or continued to emerge throughout the Georgian history? During the time of King George III, who was King David's grandson and father of Queen Tamara, there was a huge revolt against him in 1177. After defeating it, he appointed new dignitaries and Kuba Saar became one of the key statesmen of the time. The Georgian historical sources specifically refer to his Kipchak origin. Kuba Saar occupied two official positions. He served as the Minister of Defense and the Minister of Foreign Affairs in modern terms. So the Kipchak trace remained and actually played a huge role in the history of Georgia. Well, thanks a bunch for assisting us in revealing one more secret of the nomads of Georgia. Madloba! What had descended from the Caucasus to the boundless open space of the Great Steppe and what had left from the steppes to the deep gorges of Georgia? We still have a lot to learn. The main discovery of today is that our ancestors had closely communicated for centuries. 
and their interactions left multiple traces. Perhaps this is exactly why the steppe nomads and Georgian highlanders are so similar to each other. The same combat spirit, the same simplicity and openness in dealing with people, and the same soliciting hospitality. Hopefully the future generations will manage to build and maintain the roads linking our two states. The roads of thousand years long friendship. <laughs>